In the Wild West, legends have emerged that are unlike many other real or Western tales. Among these, the alleged death stands out prominently. While there is, of course, an official version of this event, as one begins to ask questions, a series of successive peculiarities come to light. Let's delve into the story of Billy the Kid. Billy the Kid was perhaps the most famous outlaw in the entire Wild West. Born as Henry McCarty in 1859 in New York to Irish parents, he later adopted the name William H. and eventually earned the nickname Billy the Kid. Little is known about Billy's father, and historians are uncertain about his name. Some speculate he may have died in the American Civil War. The only certainty is that his mother, Catherine, raised him. After Catherine's husband passed away, she moved to Indianapolis, where she met a man named William Antrim. They later moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and got married. Unfortunately, at the age of 14, Henry lost his mother to tuberculosis. After his mother's death, he worked for room and board for a local innkeeper. At this point, he started using the name Harry Antrim, adopting it from his stepfather, who had not been heavily involved in his upbringing. Interestingly, despite being described as disciplined and helpful both at school and work, he committed his first crime in 1875 by stealing food. Just ten days later, he and others robbed a Chinese laundry, taking clothes and two pistols. Two days after his arrest, he managed to escape. Reportedly, his small stature allowed him to climb out of the chimney. He then sought out his stepfather, who disowned him, marking their final encounter. Heading from New Mexico toward the Arizona territories, Antrim settled in, finding employment. It's worth noting that he regularly squandered his earnings on gambling. A turning point in his criminal career came when he was employed by a well-known rancher, Henry Hooker. During this time, he met a Scottish criminal and ex-soldier named John Archer, who would play a significant role in his future activities. From then on, they camped near the Arizona-New Mexico border, stealing horses from soldiers. By this time, he had earned the nickname The Kid, primarily due to his slim build and smooth-shaven face. In 1877, he committed his first murder in a saloon in Bonita, shooting a man named Frank who had allegedly been harassing him. They had a history of animosity, exchanged curses, and the gun accidentally discharged during their scuffle. Antrim initially fled, but later returned, and he was apprehended and jailed in Fort Stanton. However, he escaped again before facing trial. Around this time, Henry McCarty, or Harry Antrim, began using the name William H. Borney, associating it with a stolen horse. He then headed back toward the Arizona territories, but the Apaches stole his horse along the way. Hungry and thirsty, he had to walk for miles before reaching the nearest settlement. When he arrived in Ford Stanton, he was on the brink of death. Still, a friend, a fellow criminal, took him in and nursed him back to health. Afterward, he joined a gang of cattle rustlers. Over the years, due to his escapes and other activities, he frequently moved between New Mexico and Arizona. This meant he wasn't treated merely as a local outlaw, but was wanted at the federal level. In 1877, he returned to New Mexico, where he joined a cattle ranch owned by a man named John Tustel. Tustel's death shortly thereafter triggered the Lincoln County Cattle War. This conflict essentially pitted two business interests against each other. On one side was the influential local elite, led by James Dolan, and on the other were the somewhat less affluent Englishman John Tustle and his partner Alexander McSweep. Tensions escalated to the point where, on February 18, 1878, unknown assailants killed, or rather, executed, John Tustle as he tried to prevent Sheriff William J. Broad from seizing his cattle to cover his partner's debt. To illustrate, Alexander Maxwell owed James Dolan $8,000. Thanks to his connections, Dolan obtained a court order to have the sheriff seize $40,000 worth of livestock and property. This seems like a clear provocation, and John Tustle fell victim to it. Following his death, Billy and a few companions vowed revenge, forming a group called the Lincoln County Regulators. Later, they hunted down the two men they suspected of being responsible for Tustle's death. Shortly thereafter, they also killed the sheriff, who had gone to collect on behalf of the businessman as well as the sheriff's deputy. Crimes continued to multiply. The Lincoln County Cattle War came to an end in the summer of 1878 with Alexander's death. 
However, this involved a specific battle on the night of July 14, 1878, when the Regulators, a group of about 50 to 60 strong, entered Lincoln. The newly appointed Sheriff George Pepin intended to thin out the outlaws infiltrating the buildings with sharpshooters. After one of his marksmen died, he had to seek assistance from the nearby Fort Stanton Fort's colonel. Initially hesitant to intervene, the colonel eventually went with his soldiers, leading to the almost decisive end of the battle. Five days after the group's arrival, the regulators entered the home of Alexander McSween. The sheriff's deputy simply set fire to the house. The outlaws, including Billy, managed to escape, but they shot and killed Alexander McSween, John Tustle's former partner. In the fall, New Mexico got a new governor in the person of Lew Wallace. He promised amnesty to the participants in the clashes, except those who had been previously charged with something, like William Borney. Therefore, he promised to testify to the governor, specifically regarding the case of the murder of a prosecutor named Huston Chapman, of which he was merely a witness. The governor agreed to a secret meeting where they managed to reach an agreement, or at least that's what the outlaw believed. According to the agreement, Billy allowed himself to be arrested, and after his testimony in court, he was supposed to be set free. However, a district attorney thwarted this, and he remained behind bars. Increasingly suspicious of the governor's intentions, Borney managed to escape on June 17, 1879. For six months, he kept a low profile, but then, in a Ford Stanton saloon, he shot a man. It remains unclear to this day what led him to this. According to some accounts, Billy praised the revolver of his future victim, Joe Grant, and asked to see it. Grant handed it over, but before Billy returned it, he noticed there were only three bullets in it. At this point, he wanted to fire an empty shot. Grant thought he intended to shoot, so when Billy pressed his other gun to his face and pulled the trigger, the pistol misfired. Billy then pulled out his own and shot Grant in the head. After that, he left town and got involved in a shootout, which he eventually managed to escape. However, he again headed to Fort Sumner with a few companions, where authorities awaited them. Until the age of 21, Billy the Kid, as an outlaw, killed a total of eight people. According to the official version, he shot another famous figure of the Wild West, Pat Garrett, the newly elected sheriff of Lincoln County, in November 1880. According to his account, the real mystery is just beginning. In 1880, Billy was finally captured by Pat Garrett on December 23rd. Until his trial in Santa Effie in April 1881, Billy wrote for letters to the governor, who, however, did not intervene. He was found guilty of Sheriff Garrett's murder. Remarkably, he became the only individual convicted in connection with the Lincoln County Cattle War, sentenced to hanging, scheduled for May 13, 1881. According to reports, the news of the death sentence did not visibly disturb Billy, he sat silently after it was read to him. Subsequently, he was held on the top floor of the town courthouse. On the night of April 28, more than two weeks before the planned hanging, while Pat Garrett, who had captured Billy, was outside the town collecting taxes, one of his deputies took five other prisoners for a meal. At that time, another deputy, James Bell, was alone guarding the outlaw. During the night, Billy asked if he could go to the outhouse. As they returned to the corner of one of the building's hallways and the deputy momentarily lagged behind, Billy slipped his thin hands out of the handcuffs and struck him down. The guard attempted to flee, but Billy the Kid took his weapon and shot him in the back. The killer then barged into Pat Garrett's office, seized a shotgun, and awaited the return of Sheriff's other deputy, Bob Allinger, to reciprocate the gunshot. Allinger did shoot, but once, when he looked up, Billy the Kid managed to shoot him as well. Afterward, he stole a horse and fled the town, allegedly singing. Despite his escape after the first capture, Pat Garrett inflicted significant damage to his reputation by allowing one of the Wild West's most wanted criminals to escape. However, Garrett did not give up. According to his account, in July 1881, he traveled to Fort Sumner to meet a man named Pete Maxwell, who knew Billy and had a $500 bounty on his head, roughly equivalent to $12,500 in today's currency. Around midnight, they were sitting and talking in Maxwell's dark room when Billy the Kid entered. Due to the dim lighting, he did not recognize Pat Garrett and asked in Spanish who he was. Garrett recognized Billy's voice and immediately shot him, hitting him in the heart. 
A few hours later, authorities examined the room and the corpse, identifying the young man as Billy the Kid. At least, this is the official version, as various accounts and sources have suggested that Garrett and Billy had known each other for a long time, and the entire shooting and identification were staged. The sheriff immediately set out to claim the $500 bounty, which he had considered taking once before, after the first capture, but the acting governor denied it to him. Nevertheless, he still fared quite well, as new Mexican towns collectively raised $7,000 for him, 14 times the original bounty. It's worth noting that in 1869, at the age of 18, Garrett simply mounted a horse in Louisiana and headed west. For seven years, no one heard anything about him. When he resurfaced in 1876, he was hunting buffalo. However, beyond this seven-year gap, Pat Garrett had other suspicious incidents. The most famous of these was the disappearance of Colonel Fountain and his eight-year-old son Henry. In 1896, well after Billy the Kid's shootout, the Colonel and his son were last seen on January 31st on the outskirts of the new Mexican town of White Sands. From then on, they were never seen again. Despite using Apache trackers and even enlisting the legendary Pinkerton Detective Agency to find them, along with the Republican Party pulling out all the stops, the efforts yielded no results. In the investigation stage, when the most progress could have been made, three months after their disappearance, Garrett was tasked with solving the case. After two years, he managed to gather enough evidence against four men. He quickly captured two of them, but the other two engaged in a shootout. Initially, he failed to apprehend them, but eight months later, they surrendered to the sheriff's office. The toughest part, however, was that even with the alleged evidence collected over two years, it was not enough to convict any of them. All four were released. This wasn't the first time Garrett was accused of possibly orchestrating the situation so that only he could resolve the case. And now, a noteworthy twist emerged in 1950. When Billy the Kid would have been supposedly 91 years old, a man named Brushy Bill Roberts from Brazov, who might have been born as Oliver P. Roberts, claimed to be the infamous outlaw himself. Even the governor of Texas met him, but he did not believe his story. The elderly man died shortly afterward, but it was later revealed that every single claim he made about the bandit's life and Billy the Kid's life was true and free from factual errors. William Morrison, a lawyer who first found the alleged old Billy, later had the deceased's body examined. Strangely, they found every injury on the old man that young Billy the Kid had suffered before. Furthermore, the lawyer managed to track down living members of another notorious Wild West gang, the Evans Gang, all of whom undeniably knew the young Billy. Four of them, under oath, testified that the old man was indeed Billy the Kid. Two of them, however, felt the memories were too distant and chose to remain silent. In 1990, experts at the Texas University Laboratory, using identification techniques employed by the FBI, CIA, and Interpol, determined that the pictures of Brushy Bill taken at the age of 14 strongly resembled the young Billy. The picture taken at the age of 71 matched in 93% based on distinctive facial features and other factors. In 2003, they attempted a DNA test, but it failed for several reasons. Firstly, the human cemetery where Billy was allegedly buried in 1884 was washed away by a flood. The damage was so extensive that many bodies had to be reburied without proper identification. In other words, the person lying under the label Billy the Kid, today might not be the one, according to the purported elderly bandit. Allegedly, on that evening, Sheriff Garrett shot a bandit named Billy Barlow, and his body was used for the procedures. Exploiting this situation, the real Billy managed to successfully escape to New Mexico. Regarding the DNA tests, in 1882, the grave of the bandit's mother was sold, so it's unclear what happened to the woman's body. It's possible that the headstone, along with the body, was transported elsewhere. In connection with this, Roberts claimed that Catherine was not actually his mother but a non-biological aunt acquired through marriage. To make the story more complete, it's important to mention that those who rejected Robert's claims uncovered a Robert's family tree, supposedly belonging to one of the elderly man's relatives. It includes a man born in 1869 named Oliver P. Roberts, whom they claim is the one brushy Bill identified as Billy the Kid. However, if he was born in 1869, he couldn't be the legendary outlaw, as he would have been close to 20 years old by that time. It's also crucial to note that Brushy Bill previously claimed to be a teenage member of Jesse James' gang, 
which is more likely an exaggeration. Whatever the truth may be, it's unlikely to be revealed in the near future. In short, we have a Wild West mass murderer who always managed to escape custody. We also have a sheriff with several suspicious incidents regarding evidence fabrication, and who disappeared from the world's eyes for seven years, reportedly possibly acquainted with Billy the Kid. Then there's the elderly man from the early 1950s, whose 100% matching wounds, almost identical facial features, testimonies under oath from former Wild West gang members, and convincing personal stories make him much more than a mere imposter. However, due to the lack of verified human remains and the consequent absence of DNA testing, it cannot be definitively stated whether the official version aligns with the true version, nor can it be declared a fossud. One thing is certain, those who knew the truth are no longer alive.